question. Okay, we just did a lot of review of free calc on Friday. What do you want? A, B. B? Okay. Yeah. I do like the way this looks. It's dark. Okay, so we, we, uh, we just reviewed a bunch of properties of logs. Like I said, it's a short assignment up to sort of remind you about that. We looked at some general things. I, I uh, reviewed with you symmetry of inverse functions, right, or inverse relations. What's the trick when you want to, if you want to graph the inverse of a relation? It's... It, well, it's ref it's true. I mean, that, that's the that's the the definition is f of g of x is x and g of f of x is x. But just graphically, right. it's, it's the reflection y over the line y equals x. But what's the little trick I showed you? Ah, uh, there you go. Ninety degrees counterclockwise, and then flip over the y-axis. Good. Okay. Uh, we looked at where did we end up here? <coughs> Okay, so here's our, here's our definition of inverses, right? And then I'm just trying to see, oh, I, I know where it was, okay? It was on this stuff right here, okay? This, this is where we left off. So, so you guys are comfortable at this point. You're comfortable, let me just check one more thing. Did we look at, covered so much stuff. Oh yeah, I did. Okay, right. We came up with we came up with two properties, right? We said that the e to the base e log of x cancels out the x because they're inverse functions. Everybody agree? So that's like saying f of g of x equals x, and the base e log of e to the x cancels out the exponential function. Okay, that's important because what that allows us to do then, that allows us to solve these kinds of equations more easily than the way you guys tend to do it. Uh, you tend to always want to rewrite a log as an exponential or an exponential as a log, but you can make this just an algebraic thing. So if, if we, if you think about this in terms of, of order of operations, this fits neatly into the way that you already think about order of operations. We know that if we're isolating a variable, we just go bottoms up, right? For on order of operations. So where is it that you get to exponentiation? Well, that comes up here under parentheses, right? Because things are grouped. Things are, things are grouped together within the function, an exponential or a logarithmic function, okay? And so, like, if we wanted to solve, for example, something like, let me make a little harder one. Like, what if we had, oh, what if we had something like this? What if we had, um, we could even do something really hard. We could do, like, well, we'll just do natural log. That's what we're working with. So, the natural log of 2x minus 5 three times that minus two equals two, no, uh, equals four. Okay, what would you do to solve for x here? You'll know how to do this, because when we isolate variables, we just reverse order of operations. So what are you going to do first? Add two. Add two, right, because First of all, we're going to add or subtract loose terms, right? Things that are that are separate terms from the, the x, right? So we'll add 2 to both sides. Good. There's step 1. And that gives us 3 times the natural log of 2x minus 5 equals 2. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me do this. 
six. Equals six. There we go. Okay, it does work out better. I, I'm smarter than I thought. All right. So uh, what's next? Divide by. Good. So we divide by, divide by three. And cancel. That was good. So then we end up with log of two x minus five equals two. So now we say it again. There you go. Now this is where we don't have any exponentials. We can skip through that step, but now we get to the parentheses part, right? These are grouped together, and so we want to undo the natural log by taking the inverse of both sides, right? So we're going to exponentiate both sides with base e, right? And what's the net effect of that? What does a base e exponential of a base e log do? cancels them out, right? Good. And so we end up with 2x minus 5 equals e squared. That looks weird, but e is just a number, right? Just like pi is. That's part of our answer. And then last two steps, add 5, divide by 2. So we end up with x equals e squared plus 5 all over 2. Okay? See how that works? So it's, it's just, just remember that you can think about this as an algebra step, right? You can undo either one of either a log or an exponential function by just doing the inverse to both sides, okay? All right, so questions so far? And just kind of an all-purpose review. Now we're going to get into the calculus a little bit. Okay, now that we've sort of reviewed how these functions work a little bit, now we'll, we'll talk about the calculus. Um, did we look at a graph at the end? I had just maybe, had I just put up the, the Desmos thing at the end? Okay, okay, so let me just show that to you again. That was kind of cool. Uh, okay, I think this is the one I wanted, right? Yeah, yeah, this is the one we left off with, okay? So we said that, that uh, if g of t equals 1 over t, the definition of log x is just, it's an area function. It's the area under the function 1 over t from 1 to x, right? <coughs> so so the, the red function is 1 over t, and if I add up the area from 1 up to x, we found that the, the red area represents the value of the natural log function, right? Everybody get that? Okay, the red area represents the value of the log function. So notice in this case that the red area is about 0.7888 blah, blah, blah. 78845, blah, 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 right? So if we just add another function here that we're going to call h of x, how about, oh, we called it l of x. l of x equals natural log of x. And let's make this like purple. Oops. Notice that, that the natural log function fits perfectly with our area function, doesn't it, right? The function that's defined as the area under, you know, the red area corresponds to the value of the green function. I think I had one more of these, didn't I? Let me just duplicate, and then maybe this is the one I wanted right here. That it? No, that's not it. What am I doing? Uh, that was there. Mm. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. This is good enough. So then, if we just, if I just plot the point. Let's plot the point x, l of x. 
or A. Oops. Okay, and let's label that. There we go. So notice that the value, the y value of that point corresponds to the area under the curve, right? And if I drag this A, if I drag the value of A, which is just the upper limit, that's just telling us, that's just X. Like, so if I stop adding them up at, like at 3, for example, right? If, I st if A is 3, then the red area, the area under 1 over T from 1 to 3 is 1.0986, blah, blah, blah. And notice that that is the value of the green function. Let me make that green. Right, that's the value of the green function at 3. Everybody get the relationship there? The value of the green curve is that corresponds to the red area up to that x value. Right? Okay, does that make sense? Give me a 1 to 5 on that. 5 meaning that makes complete sense. 1 meaning that looks like gibberish. Okay. All right, I mean, we're, that's not bad. That's not bad. Questions? to make everybody feel even better about it. Right? So would it help to do this maybe? What if I did what if I just made that one over T? So I take take the middle man. I don't really need that G of T in there, do I? Right, that's just the area under the function. Does that make sense? So we're adding up the area under that curve from 1 to x, and we're letting, we're letting x equal 3. That's all we're doing, right? And then we said something else, too. We said if we go down, remember this? We said if we go down to about 2.2, if a is 2.2, then, oh, what the heck? Oh, no, it's 2.7. No wonder. Huh, that's right. If we pick 2.7, come on, <laughs> can't get it on 2.7. Uh, right there. Look, we're just a smidge under 1. If we go up to 2.8, we're just a smidge over, you can see, right? What if I type in a decimal value? What if I make this instead something like 2.7, just arbitrarily, 1, 8, 2, 8? Yeah, that's the special number. Now look what we get, 0.99999. I mean, I only took it out to five places, but I could keep going with that as far as I wanted to. And at some point, out to however many digits that is, it would be exactly 1, right? And so that is a decimal approximation of the exact value of x that's going to make the area under the curve precisely equal to 1. Okay? And that's what we call e. Right? That's, that's how we define e. e is, is the value of x such that the area under 1 over t is precisely equal to 1. Okay? Okay, so I think you got a fairly good idea what that's all about. And you can look at the textbook a little more if you'd like. But now what can we do with this? So if this is true, here's our area function that defines natural log. We can pretty easily get some calculus out of this. If that's the definition of log x, what's the derivative with respect to x of log x equal to? Well, it's going to be the derivative of that thing, isn't it? The derivative with respect to x of the integral from a constant to x of 1 over t dt equals what? 1 over t. That's our trick. That's the second fundamental theorem of calculus, isn't it? Right? 
remember that if this is a variable, right, we just end up with whatever, if we're going to call this f of t, then our answer is just going to be f of, and this up here we're going to call g of x, then it's just f of g of x times g prime of x, right? Well, g of x is just x. And what's the derivative of f of x? f of x is just x. What's the derivative of x? 1, right? So we end up with f of x, but f of x is 1 over x, right? So we get the answer then. The derivative with respect to x of log x equals 1 over x. There's a new derivative that we have, right? Now we could go, we could, we could chain ruleify this if we wanted to. We could say the derivative with respect to x of log u would equal what then by the chain rule? 1 over u times u prime, yeah, right? And there's a new standard form for us, okay? Uh, looking back at our, at our graph of, of log x, what's the domain of log x again? So green function is log x. So what's the domain? Can I include 0? No. So just all positive numbers, right? Can't, it's not defined for negative numbers, only for positive numbers. Okay. So then we do have to be a little bit careful with this. What's the one thing we probably have to remind ourselves about when we're dealing with these x's? Yeah, this is the, the, our standard form for the derivative of log x, but what has to be true of x? Has to be greater than 0, doesn't it? And so down here, u would have to be greater than 0, right? Okay? All right, there is something unique we'll do with that, but I'm not going to spring it on you quite yet. So let's just try a couple of these. Let's just try a little bit of practice. All right, so what if we've got something like start uh, easier. What we get? taking the derivative of log u, what is that? Okay, and, and, you, and it's, it's kind of useful, honestly, to write this one as just u prime over u. It's an easier way to think about it. So once again, so what's, what's u prime going to be? Divided by u. So what is that? 1 over x. Okay. Uh, good. Could we have done this a slightly different way? Could we have simplified our log first? Yeah, we could have. So, well, what's, what's our property of log c? The log of a product is equal to? The, okay, the, the log of a product equals the, the sum of the individual logs, right? So we'd get the log 2 plus the log x, right? And now if I differentiated that, what would I get? What's the, what's the derivative of log 2? Zero. How come? Two. Well, but I only have to do that. Because the derivative of 2 prime is the derivative well, of 2 zero. The derivative of 2, okay. But without even thinking about that, you can take this back to even more basic principles. 
Yeah, it's a constant. Log 2 is just a number, isn't it? Derivative of a constant is? Zero. Yeah, so this is a constant, so we know its derivative goes away, and the derivative of log x is 1 over x. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, so what if we have y equals the natural log of 3x to the fifth? What's y prime going to be? Okay, what'd you, how'd you get that? What are the steps you went through? I just did uh, log of 3 and log of 5 log of x. Okay, so, so you used properties locked first, which is fine. So what does this tell us? We can, we can rewrite this in simplified form. So if I have, I have the log of 3 times x to the fifth, so that's the same thing as saying log 3 plus log x to the fifth, then what's my property of logs that allows me to deal with an exponent? Okay, you just pull it out front, don't you? Right, so this is equal to log 3 plus 5 log x. And now if I differentiate, the derivative of log 3 is going to go to 0 because that's a constant. And then here I just leave the 5 out front, and the derivative of log x is 1 over x times 5. It's 5 over x, right? Okay, what's the alternate approach to that? We can also just power through it using our standard form of a derivative. So what's u prime? Good, 15x to the fourth divided by 3x to the fifth equals what? Well, 15 over 3 is 5. x to the fifth on the bottom and x to the fourth on the top gives, leaves us an x on the bottom, doesn't it? Okay, good. So you're getting the idea. Uh, okay, last issue I want to just present to you here. You, and you'll just get some practice with that too. But what if you had something like... Like this. Here's a good one. had something like this. What if you had something like uh, two things. One of these first. So what if I had f of x equals natural log of x times the quantity x squared plus 1 squared divided by the square root of 2x squared minus 1. Okay, now just pause. I want you just to think about this for a second. Think strategically. So much calculus is just strategy. What are your options for finding this derivative? Okay, so, so you could use properties of logs here first to simplify what you're getting at, right? Okay, and that then there's we could talk about the specifics of that. What's your other option? Okay, good. So you, the the whatever is inside the log, we're gonna take the the derivative of log u is just u prime over u. So I could behind my hand is u, right? So we could do u prime divided by u. Does that seem like a lot of fun? No. Not to me. That's a lot of stuff. You've got quotients and, and products and chain rules all mixed into one. That's a pretty ugly derivative, isn't it? So would you agree it is definitely in our best interest to utilize properties of logs here? Right. So what, let, let's do that. So we end up with, how are we going to split this up? Well, we've got a quotient, right? So we can say we've got the log of the top minus 
the log of the bottom. Okay, now what can we do to this, this guy here? Okay, good. I got the log of a product, so I can I can turn that into a sum. I can split this apart into log x plus log x squared plus one squared minus log square root of two x squared minus one. Now what? This guy's done, right? How about this one? Yeah, good. I could I could pull the power down and make it a coefficient, right? That's good. So that leaves leaves us log x plus two log of x squared plus one. How about over here? Ah, good. It's a square root, so that's a, that's a one half power, isn't it? So I could pull the one half power out front. Okay, now what? Can I do anything else with that one? Okay, I'm glad you're pausing to think about this, because there's a tendency, you want to keep going. But we've reached the end, haven't we? Right, we can't go any further, because remember how what we talked about on Friday. Logs simplify things, right? They take everything one step down the, the ladder of complexity with our arithmetic operations, right? Exponentiation goes to product. Products and quotients go to sums and differences. But that's the bottom of the ladder. There's no place for a sum or a difference to go. And so here I've got the log of a sum. So you've got to notice here that I'm taking the log of something plus something, and here's the log of something minus something. I'm done. I can't go any further. There's no, I fall into, who knows, a black hole or something. If I try to take one more step down, it doesn't work. So that's our answer. But that's still pretty good. I mean, we can take the derivative of this pretty easily now, can't we? Right, if we wanted to differentiate. So now if we want to do f prime, we just differentiate term by term. So what's the first derivative of log x? 1 over x. OK, how about this guy here? I've got a 2 out front. What's the derivative of log hand? It's going to be, just in general, it would be hand prime over hand, right? So what's hand prime? divided by x squared plus 1. And I've got this additional 2 out front. So what does that do? That's just going to make the top into a 4x, right? Okay, So we end up with. And then finally, over here, I've got my 1 half. So we're going to multiply the bottom by 2. What's the log of 2x squared minus 1? So I'm going to get, yeah, I'm going to get 4x over x squared minus 1 times 1 half. Well, 1 half makes the top into a 2x, right? Okay. So we're able to get a pretty easy answer, right? And that's as far as we need to go. That's our derivative function. Okay. How much time we got? One minute. Okay, I'll stop there.